we are part of an amazing global movement happening right now. People are taking their passion for music and turning it into a thriving career. We want to share these stories of these brilliant people who are making a living from their music, who have started from scratch and are now doing it on their own terms. They have created a solid career from their music, being featured on films, TV shows, video games and movie trailers. They are living the dream. And you know what? We want to show you that you can do it too. Now here's your host, Guy Jones. Hello and welcome to the Composer Stories podcast brought to you by Protégé. I'm so excited about our guest for this podcast, Mr. Kent Carter. He has been a professional in the sync business as a music supervisor and composer with credits all over streaming platforms and American and British broadcasting. One of his most recent trailer placements was The Ballad of Buster Scruggs on Netflix, which, if you're like me and you're a fan of the Coen brothers, you'll find this pretty impressive. We're going to talk about what it's like to be a composer for libraries and get some direct insight from a music supervisor who works for one of the most successful music libraries today. So, let's get into it. Right off the gate, thank you so much for spending a bit of time out of your day to do this, Kent. So do you want to just kind of start off by explaining who you are and where you're from to begin with? Let's not even dive into the music business stuff first. Let's just kind of uh, go to a bit of your history. Sure. Uh, I born and raised, not born, but raised in Bakersfield, California. Um, so interestingly, I, I hated country music growing up. <laughs> And it wasn't until I moved to San Francisco, where I'm at now, that I uh, actually became to love it and uh, actually enjoy composing and co-writing with people like yourself, Guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because the, the Bakersfield sounds quite famous, isn't it? It is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I grew up with Buck Owens was there in every parade with his uh, Cadillac <laughs> with the big long horns on the front. And he had silver yeah. dollars, you know, bucks yeah. in a seat. And yeah. Uh, yeah, if you're, if you're ever out, actually, in California and want to see a great piece of music history, there's a, a place called the Crystal Palace, and it's his place, and it's got a ton of great memorabilia from that era, like all the nudie suits, and um, anyway, it's just a great piece of music history to check out. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, basically, uh, I got out of Bakersfield as soon as I could. I ended up in San Francisco. Uh, I moved here, actually, to, to play punk rock. Um even though I'm classically trained on the upright bass. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I have actually have a music degree from Brigham Young University. I was actually raised Mormon. Um, I'm one of the, my only classmates that is actually doing what they studied in college for a living. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> everybody else studied something else. So, and what was ironic was at the time, everybody, including my parents, were like, how are you going to make a living doing this? Um, so anyway, I, I managed to, to figure that out. Um, but yeah, I did, uh, you know, played punk rock, played greasy rock and roll, um, played Americana, did all kinds of live stuff here in San Francisco. And then about five or six years ago, I decided to retire from, um, you know, playing out live. It was just taking too much time and my composing career was going really well. So I was doing plenty of music and, uh, and then my kids were getting older too. And, and, uh, I just really wanted to have a lifestyle where I could spend more time with them. Yeah, uh, and I think I think it's the very um, the same story for everyone who's doing what we do, really, which is sort of composing or music supervising or working in the library music business. Is we all kind of started off sort of wanting to be the rock star. I think that that's all that's always been everyone's dream. And then I think some people, uh, I'm not sure if this is you, but some people kind of decide that they don't necessarily like the performance side of music, but they grow fond of the sort of studio side of it and they like the writing. Is that, was that you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I was in a band, we were on an indie record label and we toured around and, you know, honestly, like I love playing shows, but it's the other 23 hours of the day when you're on tour that I Uh just, it, it was tough. I mean, you live like a dog for, in most cases. And, um, you know, met a lot of great people, had a lot of great time. It was a great experience. Uh, you know, my bandmates were still really close friends. You know, they're like brothers to me. Um, but I just, I just did not like that. You know, I, I'm much happier sitting at home by myself with playing with my own toys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, and you, so you touched on um, you started composing a little bit as well. When when did that start? So you were playing shows in San Francisco. 
when did you sort of get your first composing gig that wasn't just composing for the band, but was maybe for a library? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, actually, I was a part of a network, and I'm not even sure if they're around today, but it was the Film Music Network, and they would post jobs. And uh, I replied to one that was actually it was a music library looking for tracks. And so I actually mm-hmm. pitched my band's album. And they came back to me and said, uh, actually, we'd like you to produce a whole album of this kind of stuff just for our library. Mm-hmm. So that was actually my first introduction to, to you know, composing for library music. And then in the meantime, you know, I've done my share of indie films and, you know, other, uh, you know, indie, you know, TV show kind of stuff uh, yeah. that I was composing music for. And um, so, yeah, so, so right from the start, when I first, uh, really the first money that came back for me when I was composing was library music. And then I really started doing a lot of, of custom stuff for local advertising agencies. And, and this was at a time where the library music was still coming up and there was still quite a bit of custom work going on. Yeah. You know, now it's quite the opposite. It's almost all library work and, and hardly any mm-hmm. custom. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that, that was, uh, that was essentially my, my transition point right there. And, and, uh, I was also doing a lot of music for websites, which at the time here in San Francisco was a a big part of it. Yeah. And so would you say that you started off kind of doing what I think most people do, which is just really write music for anything you can get your hands on? Um, maybe doing a bit of music for free, a bit of music for very little, uh, and then you've you've just kind of grown from there and you've sort of developed relationships with a certain library that you've grown to love now and you sort of you pretty much you work exclusively for one library don't you now in the composing sense yes yes absolutely i i, uh, I actually exclusive with the alibi music library um and i have a very close relationship with the owner a professional relationship i've worked with him for uh you know at least 15 years. So, yeah, you know, I always say the trick in music is you got to be able to put your music somewhere and where money's going to come back mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. wherever you find that route, whatever it is. And most of us do a lot of different things to, to solve that problem. Um, you know, you got to be a little bit like water. You might think like, uh, you know, this is what my music career is going to be like. But then when you start doing things and money comes back, you know, I yeah. feel like uh, we should be open to those, those doors and, and open to, you know, changing our minds of what it actually is. Because yeah. I, I say, you know, whatever you do, if you have a work in music, like you're lucky, like you really yeah. can't complain that much. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah, especially if you can call it a full time job as well. I mean, we're, we're both very lucky in that. And I think you have to, you have to really stick with it for a long time for it to get there. And you, you kind of make mistakes that you think are going to be the be all and end all, but they're really not if you keep pursuing um, and I remember the first, so I, we know each other very well because we both work for Alibi and I do a lot of, com- I probably do 80% of my composing for Alibi. And, um, my introduction was through another one of your colleagues who got me to write a acoustic singer songwriter album because I was the acoustic singer songwriter guy. Um, because that's all I knew that's, I went out and I played shows and that's what it was. So, um, And that was fine. But I had this little sort of itch inside me that wanted to be Hans Zimmer. So for pretty much any brief that Sam would send me, I'd kind of try and trickle any of that kind of stuff in without really realizing what the job was. Um, Luckily, Sam was a darling and he kept giving me work and just told me to write the song. (laughs) Um, but I think it's, it's a very easy trap to fall into is that you can, you can find artistry in the brief and you can, you can take anything from almost any brief and make it your own and make it a great album. I mean, I know for a fact you've worked on, um, like a flamenco album, you do a lot of rock, um, you do all sorts. I mean, you had, um, you had a flamenco track in, uh, the Jesus rolls recently, didn't you? And that was a great track. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and just to kind of throw a few names out there, you did a ballad of Buster Scruggs, the Netflix trailer. And, um, that was very Americana. Was that, um, easy for you because of your not country roots, but your country knowledge? 
I think so. You know, at, at some point, I think everybody, we have to come to grips like, well, yeah, that's where I grew up. That's a part of me. That's who I am. Uh, yeah. You know, it wasn't necessarily the music that I listened to by choice, but it was all around me and just yeah. the, the culture itself. I was surrounded by it. You know, Bakersfield's an interesting place. It's in California, but it really is more like growing up in a small town in Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and you would have had an insight into that style of music without even realizing, like such an in-depth insight into that style of music um, that definitely does have a place in um, our business. So you know how to write that stuff without even realizing you do. Yeah. You know, I think, I think that's it. You know, we, uh, f- we all need to play to our strengths and mm-hmm. you know, if any composer out there is saying, Oh, I can do everything great. They're lying yeah. <laughs> yeah. more than likely, you know, yeah. and, but that's good news because you don't have to be great at everything. You just have to be great at a few things, you know, to mm-hmm. really make a career out of it. Yeah. And then I think from that point, it really is about building the relationship with, um, a library owner or a music supervisor or the guy who sends out briefs from the library. That's, that's when you have to build those relationships and you become their go to Americana guy or their go to Bakersfield country guy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, finding the right people is the hardest part about this business because yeah. as we all know, there's this business attracts a lot of, you know, for lack of better words, wannabes, shysters Mm -hmm. you know it's it's a cool thing to be a part of yeah um and you know like i said the trick is finding the right people that are it's a real business where Mm -hmm. you are doing something you are getting paid for it and they respect that and they're honest and I'm, i'm sad to say that that is hard to find um yeah and i always tell people who want to get in this business you know, buy some really tall boots because you're gonna have to wade through a lot of bullshit. Yeah, no, it's true. It's absolutely true. And um, and I, I I really do think that if you're honest and you work hard and you listen to what you're being told, for example, if you send a track and someone comes back to you with loads of notes to change stuff, you you listen to those notes, you make those changes, and you trust the process. You you don't let any ego get inside your head. Um, because it doesn't matter how good you are if you're not delivering what the client wants, which would be a library owner or a music supervisor, then you're not doing your job and you won't get more work. Yeah, that, that's a super great point. Um, you have to have this mentality of what you're doing is really, it's a craft Mm -hmm. and, uh, yes, you're an artist as well, but essentially the, the, the whole team that's giving you feedback all they want is your track to be great. And if people are in that position where they're giving feedback, more than likely they've earned that and they, they know yeah. what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. And um, so I've always approached that that way. That feedback is like, okay, this needs to happen to make this a great track because in the library business, if it's not a great track, it'll never get licensed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to jump to a question that I had later for you then. Do you think it's quantity or quality in um, library music, or is it a bit a bit of both? Well, I would say it's a bit of both, both in the sense that it has to be quality and quantity, <laughs> mm-hmm. because yeah. you're mainly getting paid on the back end for placements, uh, whether it's part of the sync fees uh, and or the performance royalties that you get. Yeah. Um, you really need to have enough quality tracks out there to be able to have enough money coming in on the back end to be able to live off of. And that yeah. frankly just takes time. Yeah, it does. And, and you really have to build, build up your catalog, don't you? I, I mean, I don't know how long it took you to start seeing money on the back end. It took me a good three or four years, really. Um, and I, I really worked at it and I, um, I wouldn't say that I trusted the process, but I didn't really have anything else that I thought was the right thing to do. So I just kept doing it. Um, the advances helped me a lot through that time. And, and I see so many bad deals out there now, um, that I'm, I'm so grateful that there are still libraries out there that pay you properly, either in advances or in a sync share or your, your fair writer's share on the back end. 
Yeah, you know, unfortunately, um, composers are super being taken advantage of. They're saying like, yes, you get to do music, but we're only going to pay you this little amount and then we're going to keep all the rights. Yeah. Like, unfortunately, yeah. That, that is a reality out there. And, you know, for all you composers out there, please do not do that because it makes it harder for everybody else to get better deals when they're able to get away from that. Um, there are yeah. definitely libraries out there that respect composers and the work that they do and, uh, and, and pay accordingly. So yeah. definitely seek out and, and, and try to, to try to find those entities. Yeah. Cause as you said, those deals are absolutely out there and, um, more libraries than not do pay fairly, but there are the few, the few that don't, that I think composers feel that that's what, when you're a new composer, you see a, a deal, which is quite a big advance, but no share in anything. You, you kind of jump on it because you don't you just think oh I'm getting paid for a track and that's great but there are better deals out there that you can have for sure yeah that's really true and you know for myself and I think this would really work out for a lot of people as well is you know I did other things to make money too mm -hmm. uh, and fortunately in San Francisco uh, which is the epicenter of the tech um, you know I, I got roped in and learning some of that tech stuff. Um, just because of friends that I had that, that there was just simply, they just needed people to do that. Yeah. What happened is I was able to develop this other side where I could basically freelance and work part time or as much as, or as less as I wanted to, yeah. to pay the bills while I was spending the money, I'm sorry, spending the time, you know, developing, doing the, uh, you know, two hours mu of music for a very mediocre indie film and getting paid $300 for it. But yeah you just have to spend that time to compose and you got to figure out a way to live and spend that time at the same time. Yeah. Cause you know, if you come to me and say, Oh, what do I have to do to be a composer? It's quite simple. You just have to compose music. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and the more you do it, the better you're going to get, the faster you're going to be and the more fluent you're going to get as well. Yeah. Um, and then at one point I was lucky enough to where I was making enough money and it did take a few years, like you're saying, to where I was able to not work in tech anymore and just do music full time. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just fantastic. Any, whenever I hear anyone that's making a living out of music, he, I mean, I, I'm quite new to that, that level and I'm really happy, <laughs> but I work really, really hard. And that's what it boils down to is you, you have to really work hard because there are so many other composers out there and so many other composers that are, massive like it's so much better than i am technically but they there's a, there's another skill that you i think you need to learn in library music and in most sort of fields of media really is that you have to work quickly and you have to work really well like your work has to be brilliant and it has to be quick and it has to be in a large quantity and that's really really hard and and have and be great to work with as well, because yeah. I, I can't yeah. tell you uh, how many great composers that we worked with that were hard to work with, and because it's so competitive, we don't work with them anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it's yeah, it's really hard. Yeah. And I was going to say that's another benefit of of working in an environment outside of music as well. Is you you get used to working with other people. You see how uh, businesses work what office life is like because the reality is, is your clients are going to be those people. So if you have a familiarity with uh, what their lives are like, what they're dealing with, their pressures, their needs, um, you're going to be able to speak their language and, and connect with them on that particular point. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And so, I mean, and to take the conversation in a slightly different direction, we, cause we've worked on quite a lot of music together now. We've, I think that was our first connection is we, wrote a bunch of music um, in a, the kind of Americana style, actually, because we were both the kind of uh, acoustic guitar, sort of bit rocky, I could sing, so you got a singer in. Um, do you do that a lot? Do you work with other musicians, or do you, you try and sort of stick to samples as much as you can? What, what's your general kind of creative process in that sense? Well, before I get to that, I want to say that we did three albums worth of music before we even met in person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is such a great time that we're able to do that. You know, yeah. typically I only collaborate when I'm working with vocalists or with uh, 
other musicians that do things that I can't replicate with samples. Yeah. Um, in general, it's a really bad time to be a studio session musician because yeah. uh, what's coming off of hard drives these days is is pretty mm-hmm. astounding. Um, you know, that said, there's there's always, you know, if, if you can sing, uh, you know, like I work with people like yourself where I can give you a piece of music and you can come up with great lyrics, great melodies. You can record yourself. You've got a great voice and you're easy to work with. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. that's hard to find, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. That, that goes back to what we were saying before about how you, you have to tick a lot of boxes to keep getting the work. And, but there are, there are plenty of musicians out there that we can work with. And, um, the fact that our first meeting was me doing a bit of remote vocals for you has led to us getting that track on Mr. Pickles, which is a a track that I'm really proud of, like that that placement I'm super proud of. And it just shows that, um, because Mr. Pickles is a very strange thing because it's 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 got a, a huge huge cult follow, following. That I mean that track online now has got about five million views. Is it? Is it almost five million? Yeah. Is it over that now? Yeah, and and it's just incredible that we can write a piece of music really quite quickly. You in San Francisco, I put vocals down in England, and then it gets placed on this show, and then five million people are watching it. And I mean, it, it took us, I, I don't know how long it took you to record and write the music for that, but it was sort of a half day's work for me to do the vocals and sing it and send it over. Um, I assume it would be about the same for you. Was is it about a day to get a track like that finished? Yeah, yeah, that, that yeah. that's about right. Yeah, yeah, and that that's really just gratifying too. And just seeing the comments of you know people were really touched by that song. Yeah, people were saying like, I want this to be played when, when I'm on my deathbed. It's like, oh my god. Yeah, um, but you yeah. know that's that's a huge reason why a lot of us got into music in the first place because we felt that from other music in our lives, and we felt like we could do the same sort of thing. So yeah. that's very gratifying. You know, paychecks one thing, but when what you're doing is really touching people emotionally, you know, that's a really powerful thing and and that's really a huge reason why I love doing what I'm doing. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think that placement for me was a, a, a big kick in the ass for um reminding me that even though we're churning out a lot of music for library just because of you know, the way the business works and how quickly the music's demanded it really reminded me that it still has to be emotional to connect with people. And the fact is when a music supervisor sends uh, a few tracks off to a client, that client has to be touched before they put it on their advert or their trailer or their program. And that, that was a big reminder for me. And I think that's a very important thing for any composer to remember. Yeah. Yeah. I really think so as well. You know, what really adding emotion to whatever Mm -hmm. it's placed against. And, uh, that's, that's why we're in entertainment. You know, we're, we're, uh, helping build things that are going to touch people and inspire people and, and uh, make them think or all different kinds of great things. Yeah. So can you remember the first piece of music that you got paid for? Yes, I actually do. Uh, despite, you know, getting paid, you know, $40 in gas money. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it was actually a band's track and I'm not even sure how it happened, but, uh, suddenly got a call from a music supervisor in LA. Somehow they had found my band's album and they wanted to license a track for this indie film coming out of Hollywood. Um, I think the only name in it was Cole Meany, who was, uh, the chief on Star Trek Next Generation or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's his name. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that was, uh, let's see, that was that was a $600 check. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, that was that's pretty good. And how, so that was your, you said you had a punk band and you put music forward to a library and that was the first introduction to library music for you? Yeah, it was. And, um, that the interesting thing too about that library, that was the first one I actually got offered in, in advance on royalties, mm-hmm. which is a really great thing. If you can find libraries that can do that, like you said, how much it helped you, you know, even if it's like a hundred dollars for track, you know, it's, it's showing, 
it, it's showing that they have faith in you that what you're going to do is going to make money someday. Yeah. Um, and at, at the same time, it, it definitely, you know, can help pay the bills, but, but it goes back to that quantity versus quality thing. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. yeah, I could, I could kick out a bunch of tracks and get a hundred dollars each as quickly as possible. Yeah. I'm not writing for that hundred dollars. I'm, I'm writing yeah. for the potential for back end that I can actually live off of. Absolutely. It takes quite a while for you to realize that. I think, no, I'm talking the universal you, um, because I, I found that, um, I fell into that trap of I'm getting paid a hundred dollars a track. So I'll, I'll kind of keep churning this out. That's my pay. And that's what I'm getting paid for this, which is great because I don't, I haven't been paid for music up until this point. So that advance is lovely. Thank you very much. And it takes a bit of a bit of time to work out that that advance is really nothing compared to what you earn in syncs and on the back end. And you really need to keep working at it and push through the, you know, the, the low payout times to get to that point. And it usually takes a few years. It certainly did for me. And I, I don't know many cases where they, that happens quicker or very quickly. You have to be very lucky, I think. I agree. And you just have to keep putting yourself out there. I mean, it, it can feel like a grind sometimes, you know, at that early yeah. stages. Um, because you're you're doing all this work for a little money, and you're 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 working on a hope <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. that someday it'll, it'll come back. But uh, you know, if you found a good library that you can tell is getting a lot of good placements, placements, you know, chances are at some point something you do for them is going to get licensed. Yeah, absolutely. And that that feeling when you get your first license is the best feeling in the world. Really, it's it's so much fun. It's so good. Yeah, I mean the trick to doing music for a living is finding a way for the world to pay you to do it. Yeah. And so when you finally, the world finally pays you. (laughs) Yeah. It's an incredible feeling. Yeah, it really, really is. So, and I'm not wrong in thinking that you uh, do some music supervising work now for Alibi as well. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, that's correct. Um, So yeah, like, like all things in music, um, it's very rare for most people in music to just do one thing. You know, it's, mm-hmm. I always say it's, it's always a pie and you have to be open to do a lot of different things in music. And I first got into music supervision just because, uh, my clients would come to me and say, Hey, I don't have enough money to, to do custom for this music, but can you help us find some music options for this project that would be cheaper? And so I would charge them like an hourly rate essentially to search for that mm-hmm. music and, and provide them some options and then deal with all the contracts and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so that was something that I, it was an add on to my original business and I was able to port that up and, and help out Alibi uh, music library with that as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so how long have you, you were working as a music supervisor before you started working for Alibi then? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And, uh, yeah, it was one of the uh, one of the things I could bring to the table um, besides music. Um, you know, I was actually hired as a freelancer to do music supervision for Alibi when it was getting started. In addition yeah, yeah. to writing music for them, uh, and then at some point it just made sense uh, for them to, to hire me. So here we are. That's that's fantastic. And so how how do you then? I mean, I think every every composer has to manage their creative side to their business side. I think everyone needs to work out how to be a head of department in their own right. And so for you as an an employee for a library, as a music supervisor as well, how do you try and manage that creativity as a writer and the business as a music supervisor and sort of looking at your overall business as a composer as well? Yeah, so... Uh, almost everybody in music, you just have to have solid business chops to, to make yeah. it. You have to understand how business works, uh, where you can fit in into that picture. Again, how, how are you going to get the world to pay you to do it? Um, you know, even when I was independent and composing custom, I was still spending a good chunk of every day doing business, like hustling for business or dealing with contracts and negotiations so really for me, it, there's really not been much of a change. I've always done part business and part music. And I think it is that way for 
you know, well over 90% of all composers that are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know yeah. that, you know, for a musician hearing like, oh, you, you got to figure out, you got to know business. Like, it's like, oh, that's, I'm doing music because I don't want to have to deal with that. And, but unfortunately, that's how the world works. And, yeah. um, and you have to be fluent in that in order to get paid. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. Because you, at some point, you're going to have to turn up for yourself and you're going to have to, um, not, I mean, it takes a long time for you to turn down jobs, but there will come a point where you can say no to a job that doesn't pay enough. And you have to be ready for that point because if you don't um, rise to that challenge when it comes about, then you could just find yourself in this circle of doing jobs for hardly any money and not really making the progress that you would like. You know, it's really like being in a band. Like mm -hmm. most bands, you get paid a token amount every gig. And if that's all you do, at some point, it's, it's either you're doing the band because you love it more than anything else or... It just doesn't make sense <laughs> to keep doing yeah. it. And yeah, it's, it's like you can get stuck just on those low paying gigs. At some point, you have to get the skills and put the energy into it that's necessary in order to get the those top tier, uh, whether it's library placements or composing gigs uh, yeah. or whatever else you can do in music. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. And yeah, and you and you said that you moved to San Fran with the punk band, and obviously that's uh, a lot of bands do that, and a lot of musicians do that who are trying to sort of push forward in the business. And um, if we think about location for a minute and library music, do you think location in this day and age matters, or do you think uh, the way that we can work online and remotely is absolutely fine? You know, that, that is a really great question. Um, you know, I think when, at the time when I moved here, it really made a lot of sense to move to a big city because that's where creative people were. There are a lot of creative projects going on. And what happens is, you know, you, you move out to a city when you're young, you get to know all these people. And then in like 10 years, they're running the town. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's as true. In fact, I know it's, that's not as true anymore. Um, you know, I, I live in San Francisco. There's frankly not a lot of music here, work here. You know, most of the work we do comes from uh, New York, Los Angeles, and London. But I, I do think that there it does make sense in some ways, especially in our industry, to be in a place like Los Angeles because that is where the work is. Your chances yeah. of getting to know people who are in the business is much greater. Um, I can I can still see that move making sense. You know, you and I have both known composers who have done that, but it's certainly possible um, to to be remote, and I'm grateful for it because I I love San Francisco, and you know I have a wife and kids now, and we're in, we're here, we're we're locked down, and and it, it's all good. Yeah, that, and that, and that's the thing, isn't it? Is if you can find somewhere where you feel at home and your work is better for it, I think that's the only thing that really matters. And um, I think if you're going to work remotely and you're not going to move to any of those big cities and everyone you work with is online, like you said, we did three albums together and we hadn't even met. I think you absolutely have to try and call people and even video call and not just be a face behind an email. I think it, it really adds uh, to your clout and when you talk to people on the phone, at least it gives you a voice. I think that's a super great point because, uh, uh, you know, if you don't know somebody, if you've never talked to them, um, things can get out of context pretty quickly. And yeah. especially when you're working on a music project, just being able to call and talk to somebody and talk about options and maybe joke about things or just, you know, you're just real people doing work together. And uh, mm -hmm. that can really, that can really change the relationship. And, uh, and and help build a relationship for for future projects as well yeah absolutely absolutely okay well i've got one more question that's uh, a bit silly but we're going to end with it um and it's not so much it's a it's a hypothetical question that's kind of four questions in one okay i'm going to read it out so i don't mess it up <laughs> so time travel has been invented you have been tasked to take on a protege that protege is you who's 
just started their career. So as part of their training, you can give them one book, one piece of gear, one piece of advice and introductory skills on one instrument. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so one book. Okay. One book, one book. This is you in the past. All right. Th this might be a weird one. Uh, there's a book called uh, pimp. Mm hmm. Are you, I don't know if you're familiar with it. No, no, I'm not. No. Um, I can't remember the, the name of the author. Mm -hmm. But actually, I read that book, and that was after I saw uh, Dave Chappelle live here in San Francisco. Yeah. And uh, if you're familiar with Dave Chappelle, he sort of had this uh, uh, experience in his life where he suddenly got really huge and was dealing with big numbers and money, and it freaked him out. And mm -hmm. he learned how the world works really fast. And his point of this book was, you know, it, the book is about what you think it is. It's about a pimp. And, you know, his uh, uh, group of hookers, there might yeah. be a name for him, but <laughs> his, his brothel. Um, and he's like, you know, this, what, the one thing this book illustrates is like, this is actually how the world works. Like mm -hmm. your ethics, your morality, that's how you want the world to be. But there's also how the world works and being able to understand that and as well having your sense of morality and being able to negotiate the two of those, I think is a very uh, important piece of, of life. And when I started out, I definitely did not have that sense of how the world actually worked. Yeah. Well, that's a really good, really good answer. Uh, okay. Uh, one piece of gear. Does a computer count? Yeah. Yeah. If it, if it, it that, that it can be it can be anything. I mean, well, it's it's hypothetical, so it's it's you in the past, but it can be any any year. Yeah, you know what? Um, a microphone. Okay. And, and the reason being is this: uh, to be a professional composer, you also have to be a professional engineer. Mm -hmm. And to be able to record, even though you might mostly be dealing with samples but understanding how recording and production works on a very nuts and bolt level is a critical piece to um, being successful as your composer because your music can be great, but it also has to sound world-class as well. And if you can get a microphone and record yourself and play around with it, learn all the tools, compression, EQ, preamps, reverbs, all that stuff, uh, and all the, all the other kind of amazing processing we can do these days is really going to be a huge part of your development as a composer. I totally agree. I think um, recording random sounds that were around me as sort of a sound effects kind of thing is what taught me how compression is working and the, the effects of EQ really, because the, you're taking sounds in their true form and you're uh, manipulating them and I think when I was recording acoustic guitars and stuff I kind of got it a little bit and I checked a compressor on and you know didn't think too much about it but you don't really um, I, I think it, it wasn't until I took those sound effects and I heard what was happening that, that it really showed me what was going on there um, okay cool uh, so one piece of advice is stay away from narcissists yeah that's a great one yeah because there's, there's a lot of them uh, okay. I, and I you know Amazingly, they seem to be attracted to this industry. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then introductory skills on one instrument, and this doesn't have to be an instrument that you can play. It could be one that you can play a bit, but one that would be the most useful to you as a composer. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, piano slash keyboard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's really. You know, in college, I did four semesters of basic piano. And uh, the reality is, is we're using a keyboard as an input device and just to be able to have some influence or, or I'm sorry, some basic skills on just how to move your fingers around the keyboard can definitely make that happen a lot faster. Yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant. Well, Kent, thank you so much for taking a bit of time to do this with me. Um, I've learned a lot. I've known you for a number of years now and I've learned a lot about your like from this chat. So thank you so much. And um is it if there's anything else you want to say or you know any last bit of advice before we ran, uh, wrap this up well i just like to say everybody uh you know interested in composing just just write music just keep writing music 
it's such a positive thing in this world to do. And if nothing else, um, that's reason enough to, to keep doing it. Yeah. Thanks so much, man. All right. Have a good day. All right. You too. Take care. We love hearing your stories. It fills us with passion and drive. Now, if you want to turn your passion for music into a thriving career, then head on over to protégéfreeweek.com for our free taster course. That's protégéfreeweek.com. See you there.